The most important thing is to understand what the difference is between the mind and the brain. Don't take someone else's model and think that that's going to work for you. You you need to be authentic. You need to be honest with yourself and you need to do what you need to do to get the productivity. Burnout comes from us, number one, not paying attention to the mind. Are there any mental exercises or techniques as a content creator that needs to come up with fresh ideas that they can use to enhance their creativity? Welcome back to the Think Media Podcast. Today, our topic is how to unlock the power of your brain as a content creator and as an entrepreneur. We're gonna be getting tips on how to get out of a rut and even how to create your best videos and tap into your deepest level of creativity with Dr. Caroline Leaf. Now, she is a renowned cognitive neuroscientist with over 30 years of experience. She's a legendary author and I've been exposed to her books now for years, like Switch on Your Brain, Your Mental Mess, Learn, uh, Think, Learn, Succeed, and her newest book, How to Help Your Child Clean Up Their Mental Mess. And today's conversation is going to be super value-packed, so stick around till the end. And Dr. Leaf, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Sean. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. I want to start off with just kind of some quick tips. And are there any mental exercises or techniques as a con content creator that needs to come up with fresh ideas that they can use to enhance their creativity? Well, there's there's a lot, but I think the most important thing is to understand what the difference is between the mind and the brain. So what I can do is give you some tips and then maybe we can dive into why those tips are so important. Um, and so that one of the one of the greatest tips for creativity is being able to manage your mind in terms of what you are experiencing in your life. So if you are anxious or stressed or highly worked up about stuff or not dealing with stuff, that is going that's almost a guarantee to block your creativity. So it's really important that we that we first sort of major tip is that we live a lifestyle of managing our minds. And we can talk what that talk about what that looks like. And then that helps us then to get into a space on a psycho neurobiological level, which is your mind brain body connection, where you can then start releasing your creativity and increasing your intelligence and things. So not unmanaged toxic stress is the, as we've all experienced, it's one of the main things that will block creativity. Then the, another thing that is a tip that may, people may or may not have realized but reading fiction consistently, not just now and then, but being absorbed in, get there's so many great series out there, but getting ourselves completely engrossed in another world is absolutely vital for creativity, vital for intelligence, vital for emotional intelligence, for self-regulation. It used to be, because I don't practice anymore, but it it would be one of the first things that I would write at the top of my prescription pad for my patients. And that would be read, 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 and read some more. And in this day and age, we don't read enough. And I'm talking about fiction as well as nonfiction. I read a lot of nonfiction. I'm a researcher. I'm always diving into science articles, but I make sure that I balance that with creativity. So if I'm having a drop in my creativity, one of the first things I'm going to do is take that time. I'll take work time that we think, oh, well, that's just relaxation time. I will be deliberate and intentional and I will read something that's will you know, take a few time, an hour or half an hour, however long it takes. And then when I feel the creativity coming back again, then I'll dive in and see where it takes me and where it leads me. So those are two sort of major tips. And the first one we can dive into in more detail if you want as we go through the interview. Absolutely. So chronic stress, if we could start reducing that, we're going to boost our creativity and we'll talk about how to manage the brain. But that's such an interesting tip about reading. And I'm curious before we move on, and I also should mention that you know, you've uploaded over 660 videos. And so we're going to be talking about even content creation. But before we move on, is there a difference between ebooks, digital, looking at a tablet, looking at your phone, and audiobooks as opposed to sitting down and actually reading words on a page with a traditional book? There is. And they, each of them are a different experience. And it's a different um, it's a different psycho-neurobiological experience. So psych meaning mind, neuro meaning brain, and biological meaning the physical body. So that each does something different. The, the interaction with the page is still one of your classic bests where you sit there with that book and you're holding it and you're turning the pages and the sensation. It stimulates such a lot of 
really great interaction. Also, the way that your your eyes, the, the light on your eyes, the way that you receive the electromagnetic light input is very, very different. So, but in this technological age, we adapt. So, for example, I, in the past, and honestly, if you asked me this question even 10 years ago, I would have said to you, we should predominantly read just paper books. So, I mean, books, hard copies, and try and not do our reading as much online. And I've changed over the years because I've seen myself adapt. And I've seen that um, that I read as much on Kindle, for example, as I'm reading a book. And, and it kind of depends on my mood, what work I'm doing. So, if I'm in a, doing what I, what I was suggesting people use reading for in terms of creativity. So if I'm finding I need a creativity boost, then I tend to read on my Kindle because it's so easy to copy and paste a phrase that will stimulate me. So when I was doing it this morning, I was actually in my sauna and um, doing, doing. Um, I've got two phones, so the one phone won't die. So I've got this old phone that I'll use in the sauna and I'm reading this on Kindle and I needed some stimulation for some content I'm creating. So, and I've been reading this great series. I'm reading this great series and suddenly this phrase of what one of the characters says popped out and I could immediately copy and highlight, highlight copy and paste that into my notes section on my phone or was in the Google Doc. I actually put it in the Google Doc and it was... It, kind of just that phrase unlocked a leash like unleashed a whole lot of information and creativity and here I'm in the sauna sweating like crazy and typing on my phone which I can't obviously type as fast as when you're on a computer but in that case that that was worked that worked very well for me but if I'm finished work and I want to continue just reading or I want a different type of experience then I will pick up a book and leaf through it if I'm searching for something if I feel the need what was that idea? What is that? What is that? What am I looking for? Then grabbing a whole bunch of books. There's something about that interaction of picking up a book, feeling it, flipping through the contents page, you know, that kind of thing. So it very much is dependent on what you are needing in that moment. But make sure that you get a balance of both. Don't just read ebooks or audio, you know, that kind of thing. I mean, audio is great for if you're going for a walk and you want to listen to the audio. If you're sitting in a sauna, or you at, doing a workout, listening to an audio book is lovely because it's very relaxing and, and um, help you keep focused in the workout or something like that. Beautiful tips. And really, creativity is the most valuable currency for content creators. And so even thinking about what books could you order and even breaking up your day, what a powerful tip that you might feel the pressure to be productive, but that is productive work if you're refueling your creative tanks. I do want to circle back on all of your powerful tips on stress, but I want to hit your experience on YouTube first. You know, many doctors and authors and people in the professional sphere uh, don't really spend time investing in YouTube and social media. So why did you originally commit to the work of uploading now over 660 videos and being active even on other platforms? You know, it's uh, probably, uh, first of all, I have an incredible team and they, um, they're very aware of it, it just you know, of the whole social media, importance of social media. Also, we have a great podcast and it's great to have the video. Some people really, most, a lot of people listen to audio as we know, but to have the video is really great for certain, you know, it's just a great way. So automatically when we did, when we do a podcast, we always have the video. So that's been a, a great, tremendous help. And we have such an active podcast, we're releasing two a week. So that's been a really great way of uploading content. But if you're going to reach people, you have to reach people through how people want to be reached. And, you know, this day and age of technology, this is that's what people love. They want that connection. And so for us to use whatever platform we can to reach people with the message that we're trying to bring, which is helping people manage their mind, because your mind is fundamental to who you are. No mind, you're dead. Your mind is your aliveness. So we wanted to our, our focus on helping people understand their mind so that they could then be productive and do whatever it is they do to make this world a better place. We had to, we decided to just use every platform we could. And obviously we haven't tapped every platform, but we realistic about, because they need management. So as you know, so they realistic about, be realistic about you know what platforms we can reach and how to do it but I have an incredible team that we work very closely and that's one thing I don't um, hive off 
creativity. Creativity is the business. I am the business. I'm the core. The, the stuff's coming from, I, I still do clinical research. So a lot of that, that's the foundation. Everything I do is the research. And in the research, I will sit with my teams and explain. And then I have great people that are able to then translate this science. They'll ask me lots of questions to get the science to a digestible point. And then that's our way then of digesting that, that digestible way of taking the science and then bringing that to the general public. And so that's really a great, very important part of our, our creativity as well. Um, so yeah, every, every platform we can reach people every way because everyone's different. So we've got to be able to tap into the, that difference to get the message across. And what advice would you give to busy professionals? I think about authors thinking about the pressures of writing, uh, pastors thinking about all of the things on their to-do list, and even business owners get into the day-to-day -day tasks maybe setting realistic expectations. I mean, you have uh, over 235,000 subscribers, 9 million views, but this took a lot of time. So is it been, I mean, is it a priorities thing for you? What's like the time management to actually block out energy to create content? Um, I'm very glad you've asked that question because that, I know this is something, and I, maybe I'm going to answer it in a very unconventional way, but there's so much, so many books out there and so many courses you can do on time management. It has been a huge focus of business for probably the last 50 years where it's, and it's become more and more popular. And you can go on time management courses, as we know, and buy time management books and do these priorities. At the end of the day, my advice to people is, you know, don't be, get overwhelmed by all that information. Really get to know yourself and what you're capable of doing and work out a time management plan that suits you, that is flexible. Flexibility, having a flexible, you know, pro probability mindset when it comes to time is so important. Because if I restrict myself and say, okay, I'm going to spend, I'm going to do this for the first hour of every day and then the next two hours I'm going to do this, it just does not work for me. It may work for others. I'm not saying that that's not the way to do it. What I'm saying is that don't take someone else's model and think that that's going to work for you. You you need to be authentic. You need to be honest with yourself and you need to do what you need to do to, to get the productivity. So people will say, don't work 15 hour days. Do work 15 hour days. Do, don't work, only work eight hours. Make sure you sleep eight hours. There's just so many rules. And I take every rule as a piece of data that's worked for someone and I'll adapt and try and see does that work for me and work out my own plan. So I'll listen to advice and I'll look at, at different options. But at the end of the day, I work out my plan and I'm t it's so flexible. I don't get thrown if I have a plan and things don't quite work. I can adapt. And that's been, I think, very, very key in my time management is the ability to have a probability mindset that Yes, I'd like to achieve this for the day, this for the week, this for the month or whatever. But you know what? Things are going to happen and I'm going to adapt. And so things don't throw me. But when I was stuck in, I must get this and this and this done and all these calendars and things that I tried for about five minutes and <laughs> realized it's not going to work for me, it created tremendous stress. Now, for someone else, those lists, those calendars, those schedules, obviously we have a, a schedule for appointments and, you know, basic things. We, we keep a very, very simple schedule that is, it, we, so we know exactly what's happening in the day in terms of, of booking things. But in terms of me with managing my time, um, the best advice I can give people is you find what works for you. Don't try and copy someone else because you are, you make a lousy someone else, but you make an amazing you. Brilliant tips. And if we were looking at the neuroscience of emotions, as content creators, we're trying to cr structure videos, we're trying to write titles, we're trying to put elements in our thumbnails that, of course, resonate deeply with the target audience that we want to reach. What, how could an understanding of the neuroscience of emotions maybe improve the content that we create in our messaging? Great question. So first of all, we've got to be careful of the word neuroscience of emotions. And the reason I say that is because in the since about the mid-90s where we've had a, um, technology to look inside the brain, we have become, and I'm not actually going to take the we out of it, science has become quite neuro-reductionistic. And so it's about brain, 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 brain. So there's been a massive move in the last 40 years to make everything about the brain. So the neuroscience of education, neuroscience of business. Neuro so it's become very trendy. And um, there's two good, there's, there's good and bad. The good is that it's very important that we do have um, a development and understanding of science of the brain. And I've been in the field for 40 years and my understanding of the brain now has improved vastly. But what I have learned most of, most of all is that the mind, the brain is not it. 
the brain is one part of a tripartite ne network, which is mind, brain, and body. And actually, the mind is it. The mind drives the brain. The mind is not the brain. And the brain and mind collectively drive the body and they work as a unit, tripartite unit. And that understanding shifted. So if we focus just on um, brain, 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 we are going to get a very filtered mechanistic view of human behavior and we're going to then start trying to follow um, very specific cookie cutter type formulas and our creativity will go for a loop. And we see this happening by the cycles that happen in in the trends that, that you know, this works, that works. And then someone just, you know, with TikTok or whatever, something goes viral and you think, but there's no rules that have, have been followed, but why has this gone viral? And that's what we see happening with social media now is things go viral or things get traction that don't seem to follow those rules that are the rules that seem to be the rules we should be following to tap into the neuroscience of emotion. So let's maybe look at it as the, the science of psychoneurobiology and look at emotions um, and looking at it from that perspective, emotions then fall into a category of signals. So emotions no longer stand alone. They are one of four groups of signals and the so when we have an emotion and, and this is very logical stuff just think of it if you feel excited you're going to feel that somewhere in your body so the first category is emotions the second category is where do you feel that emotion in your body and then the third category is you know how is that influencing your behaviors what you say and what you do and then the fourth category how is that improving uh, influencing your perspectives so emotion the neuroscience of emotion should shift to the psychoneurobiology of emotion, and that tells us that emotions one of four signals. And emotions on a neuroscientific level, emotions have a chemical and protein signature in the brain. They have a protein and chemical signature in the body that looks different, and they have a gravitational or biofield in the mind. So they have three different representations. But those emotions never live alone. They always live with the other other three signals and those four signals together are always attached to content and that content is an experience and an experience basically is a thought and a thought is made up of memories now, i know i've said a lot so let me just track that back so you've got you've got um, emotions as one of four signals four buckets think of four buckets emotions that are linked to body sensations behaviors and perspectives those are signals taking us to an experience they're not living alone they're attached to something and that what they're attached to is an experience an experience is actually just a word for thoughts thoughts are a cluster of memories so we have like this conversation now we, there's a lot of stuff going on. There's a lot of words going out. Those words are memories. So at the day days, memories, they're clustering together to form a thought. That thought is how we can use, understand the brain and the mind and psychoneurobiology when it comes to being create, create, creating content on YouTube or social media or whatever, but predominantly YouTube. Um, and so that's, that's the name of the thought. So if you had to tra name this tree, would be the name of this podcast. The things we're talking about would be the memories of this podcast and this whole thing is an experience if that makes sense and what you and i are saying like the questions you're asking and the answers that i'm giving would be at the root if you think of a thought looking like a tree and then the each every single listener and viewer is hearing this according to their own unique way that they think feel and choose so think of that as being the tree trunk so you and i are delivering the root memories and in this experience or thought and each listener and viewer is processing it through the tree trunk but their own unique tree trunk their own unique way that their mind works in other words how they uniquely think feel and choose and then they grow little branches each of us grow branches and those branches are dependent on the unique way that the person's perceived the information therefore every single person listening and viewing is growing their own cluster of branches that is different to one else now in those branches are all this data and those and um, those data are all then producing those four signals so emotions are buried within all of this stuff because they right from the roots through the processing they the, those four signals grow all the way through and they produce how we show up so in knowing that the totality of the experience, we need to rather think about how big, how, when we think of an emotion, we need to think of, okay, it's going to affect all four signals. It's going to be related to an experience. There's going to be a source. And if you track that concept, you're going to give something that is very authentic. And that's what you want to get to, to get people's attention and it may take time it may take time not everyone gets that viral hit and suddenly they have 20 million followers or they have a book a new york times bestseller or something it's it's 
And we need to also stop looking at those kind of numbers because it's very, it can block us. We need to look at numbers, yes, but we need to look at the process and the experience more and the totality of that experience because that will help us grow our authenticity. And as we grow our authenticity, we will produce content that taps into the emotions plus the other three signals plus the experience plus the roots. You want to, you want to attach that. You want to um, um, dive into that whole person's experience, not just have a surface band aid kind of thing. Now, that's quite a complex answer. I don't know if that made sense. <laughs> You're welcome to unpack it with questions. Yeah. Um, very fascinating. And, you know, we are listening to an expert here and we would, uh, most of us as listeners, obviously be newbies to neuroscience or be living kind of on the surface. If you were to give us, in light of all of that information, what steps we could take practically on a week by week, month by month b basis to become more authentic so that in our content and so that we create an emotional experience or emotional response, knowing that it could block us if we're just trying to have a New York Times bestseller or a viral video. But at the same time, of course, our desire is to grow, grow our business, reach more people. And yeah, and so we're so we're wanting to, okay, well, maybe my content's a two right now and I want to get it to a 10, at least within my ability, my skill set, the way I communicate, and this could and then it could go into all kinds of nuanced things, maybe the way I articulate things and am I kind of almost my EQ, my emotional control, the way I deliver information, what people feel, the kind of frequency I'm communicating on. So if we made it as simple as possible in terms of what prescription would you give people that they would start showing up more authentic and really be able to practically apply your answer? The best way to do that is to learn to manage your mind, which involves self-regulation, which involves being very observant about yourself and the impact you have on yourself and the impact you have on others. And that's a life skill. And it's something that you pretty much do for your entire life. And it it improves your quality of living. It en enables you to embrace the issues of life, the challenges of life in a way that makes you very authentic. You know, that you're not going to try and just pathologize things or me medicalize misery. It's going to be, hey, I embrace this depression that I'm feeling or this overwhelm or this burnout because there's something that I am. It's not who I am. <clears throat> it's because of something. And what is that because of? And what can I learn this? Or maybe you're scrolling through social media or scrolling through someone else's YouTube channel and thinking, oh my gosh, they've got so many you know, likes on that particular YouTube video or they've got so, or that social media, whatever, they've got so many, so much content and you start feeling envy and you start, and, and instead of running from that and think, oh, I've got to push that down, see that envy as an emotional signal that's actually good for you. And it's telling you something. So don't see it as a threat that you need to suppress. See it as something that you should embrace, process and reconceptualize. So and that way you shift your neurophysiology and now you say, okay, I am envious of that. So why? Let me unpack why. Let me start being very focused on understanding that particular emotion. Where does, what else goes with that envy? Maybe there's a tad, a bit of jealousy. Maybe there's a bit of frustration at that. And, and that frustration is at yourself, perhaps. And then what behaviors, how's that influencing your behaviors? Where are you feeling this in your body? How is that shifting to your perspective? You know, ask yourself those four questions about those four signals from that experience. And then ref so you, you gather that. Then you, you reflect. You go into a process of reflection. And the reason that I'm going to say this now is because we're in a world that tells us to talk about our feelings. There's a lot of stuff on feelings, mindfulness, meditation, breathing, and all of those are excellent. But all of what, if you just do meditation, breathing, calming down, mindfulness, mindfulness, CBT, all those different things, and you do them in an erratic way. They're going to get your brain, mind, body prepared for stuff, but it'll be more of a unsustainable band-aid approach. So what that means is that it's going to help you in the moment, but maybe not in the long run. So you may, for the moment, put out the fire of the jealousy, but you haven't learned anything from it. So you may do a breathing technique to calm you down. Or you may mindfully become aware of you feel this envy and then you push the thought aside. Or you may use a CBT technique to say, okay, I don't need that envy. It's going to block my creativity. But you don't deal with it. You simply just redirect to another thought. None of those are solving a problem. None of those are sustainable. They're going to make you feel good in the moment. They're going to give you a burst of creativity. But in the long run, they're not going to 
put you on a sustainable path to creativity. So I would recommend then once you're aware that you connect all four and then you go into deep process of reflection. And a focused reflection is kind of like shining a white light through a prism. And if you think of it, when you shine a white light through a prism, you may or may not have done this, but it comes out as a rainbow on the other side. So the depth to reflection is depth. The point, sorry, the point of reflection is depth. Why am I feeling envy, frustration and jealousy and all these sensations in my body, why am I, the who, the what, the when, the where, the why, the how, what's the pattern, what's the cause? In other words, you start going to that tree, seeing the branches, tracking down to your thinking process and finding the origin. And that's a deconstruction process. It's an embracing process where you deconstruct. It's hard work. It's very painful. <clears throat> It can be very challenging, but it's very productive because you'll get to that point where you realize what that envy, jealousy was, and then you can start reconstructing and saying, well, because you, you, you're never going to forget that YouTube video that you saw or that person's YouTube videos that made you feel envious. So that's never going to go away because once you've had an experience, it's with you forever. But you can change how it's going to play out into your future. And that goes through by doing this process, you actually shift how you are looking at that information in your life. And so you would then go to sort of a reconceptualization phase and then create some sort of an action that then takes you into how am I going to deal with this? So what have I learned from this? What can I do? I'm envious and jealous because of this. It actually goes down to a base core thing that that's really what I want to achieve, but I'm not that person. What can I achieve? What's realistic for me? What can I do that's authentic to me as a person that can touch other people's lives? Why do I want to be like that person? You can't be like that. You know, that's all that sort of reconceptualization that gives us a sense of peace and direction and then we can say okay well what are my action steps now that process if you do it once will not do anything for you it'll just start the process it's something that you're going to have to do daily for at least nine weeks because what you're doing is you are taking something that's major to your life. You're a content creator on YouTube. That's why they listen to you. So that's their major focus and big part of their business. I'm assuming that this is the majority of people that are listening to this. So if you want to get into that authenticity that is going to generate the content that will touch people's lives, you're going to have to find out the things that are blocking how you function and blocking your creativity and using those, like the envy and the jealousy or something like that. I just gave that as a simple example. It could be something else. It could be a lack of, it could be shame. It could be you thinking, how could I ever help anyone else? I'm not good enough. Or it could be a bunch of stuff. Um, it could just be, I just don't know how to do this. Then it's, then you find that out and you get the skills and you learn how to do it and you, and that kind of thing. But it's not going to, you're not going to change immediately. This observation, this ability to stand back and observe ourselves, that I call the multiple perspective advantage, where you stand back and you observe how you're showing up through the four signals and tracking it through and taking it through this process. It's a planned and guided process of observation and deep connection that is a very conscious, deliberate, intentional process that connects you with your non-conscious. And if you do that daily for around five to 15 minutes over cycles of nine weeks, which is the time it takes to rewire networks, you're going to not only deconstruct and reconstruct something that's blocking you, but you're going to create a whole network that's going to drive you in, a, to, in leaps and bounds into another dimension. Um, and it may take multiple cycles, but each cycle will take you to that next dimension. Um, and it's that work because what drives you are these networks. So that envy is a signal of a network that's driving you. So find the network, use what's good about it, fix what's not good about it, and therefore change how it plays out into your future. But that's a, there's no quick fix for that. People are in a world where we look for, give me the five steps and the quick technique to improve my creativity. I can't do that. I can tell you the planned and guided process that works in cycles of nine weeks because I've spent years researching how long it takes to form a habit and how long it takes to rewind networks, which is all related. And I've got massive studies running currently and I've just published another paper. We've got five under in under review this year. I've just published two have just been released for publication. Uh, what I'm saying is that there's a ton of science behind what I'm saying. And the good news is that it works. The bad news is that it's going to take time, but it works. Hey, in just a second, we're going to get right back into this episode of the Think Media Podcast. But if you haven't heard, for a limited time, you can get 90% off the complete package for growing a successful YouTube channel in 2024. Our epic holiday sale includes our YouTube Shorts Masterclass, AI for YouTube Guide, Niche Finder Course, YouTube Starter Kit, and a ticket to our live virtual event, the YouTube Roadmap Workshop. This bundle of resources is valued at over $2,500, but you can get 98% off for a limited time at thinkmediasale.com. 
thinkmediasale.com. So just go to thinkmediasale.com before this offer expires. And now let's jump back into the episode. If one of the best ways we could create better content that resonates more deeply with people is to be showing up more authentically, to do that going through this process. And the word I'm maybe oversimplifying down to is that we need to grow in self-awareness. And self-awareness is a lifelong process. And going in, reflecting, and having, where is this emotion coming from? Where is that coming from? Doing that work helps us grow in self-awareness. And I've often heard it said, self-awareness is a superpower, especially for an entrepreneur, a leader, a content creator. But am I oversimplifying just by calling it self-awareness? Or at least is that somewhat accurate? It is oversimplifying and it's and there's no, and no criticism intended. It's it's totally understandable because that's what's uh, uh, in the word emotions, emotional intelligence, um, neuroscience of emotions and awareness are all over the business literature and all over media and are used incorrectly. So it's not incorrect for you to say it like that, but there's so much more. Awareness is one of, it's just there's, there's different types of awareness, but it's, uh, and it's only the first stage. There's four more stages after that, and there's a preparation stage prior to that that then gets you into the, the into the, the the right direction. So the better word would be self regulation, which includes um, the concept of awareness plus so much more. So because because awareness incorporates things like mindfulness, and you get general awareness and focused awareness, and it incorporates as I said things like mindfulness. But that's not enough. You've got to go beyond that. And um, so mind management that is the term that I use. That is then training, when you manage your mind, you're basically training this concept of self-regulation. So your superpower is mind management, of which the tool is self-regulation. And self-regulation um, is when you self-regulate and mind manage, you are changing those networks. You're doing all the stuff that I've been saying. And so what I did to make it simple for my patients years ago when I was working with people with dementias and Parkinson's and you know ADHD and autism and severe trauma, then adapting that just to life and living and, you know, the things that are not so traumatic, but that are just bad habits we develop and day-to-day -day struggles. I developed a system um, that is a, a system that you can fit all these different mindfulness and CBT and uh, techniques that are great, great advice that's out there. Um, what I saw lacking was great advice, but I didn't, what I didn't see um, was a way to put this together that it actually changes the networks in your brain and therefore drives neuroplasticity in the direction that it should go in. So the system I've developed, which I actually was describing the previous step, I just didn't name it, is called the neurocycle. And the neurocycle then is incorporating the elements of awareness. So the neurocycle is the name of the mind management tool that you use to develop self uh, self regulation and can be adapted to business, to education, to dealing with a relationship, because it's basically how you manage your mind. It's basically a life skill. So it's a raw fun fundamental principle into which you can put anything. And so you, the first thing you would do, <coughs> excuse me, is prepare. You prepare the brain. And that's where things like breathing and meditation and mindfulness exercises and decompression and all those kinds of things come in. And then you would go into the awareness. That mind, all that preparation stuff will create general awareness and will create, you know, the awareness of your body and sounds and, and sensations and thoughts moving through your mind and that kind of thing. Um, and generally the instructions from those is, you know, let the thoughts crash on the beach or that kind of thing. But you, you can't stop there. The equivalent of doing that and not doing anything else, which I call pretty much band-aiding, it's going to help, but it's a band-aid approach. The equivalent, if we took something like flying, flying an airplane, would be the preparation that is done before a plane takes off. So, for example, you've got your pilot, you've got your co-pilot, you've got your engineers, you've got all the rules, and there's incredible procedures that are involved. There's a tremendous amount of preparation before a plane takes off. But if you only do the preparation, the plane stays in the, air, in the airport and doesn't go anywhere. So you don't want to do that with your life. You don't want to just have your creativity all, like, primed, but it doesn't really go anywhere. So now from there, you need to move to the next phase, which is taking off, which is a very planned and guided process once again. And that's now where you gather awareness. So it's not just general awareness and mindfulness, which you need first. You have to have that. It primes you. Now you've 
start taking off. And that's where you now gather awareness. So the word gather is very selective. It implies selectivity. It implies choice. It implies control. It implies empowerment. It implies internal locus of control. You are driving. What am I going to focus on? And that's where your four signals would come into play. You would gather awareness of those. Then once you're flying, if you know how to take off, but you don't know how to fly, you'll crash. So we see from a lot of the literature that people on a um, mental health level, if they just prepare meditation, mindfulness, and they talk about just emotions, they crash because they don't know what to do with what they've brought up in terms of business, creativity, developing content. If you just prepare and you just take off, it's going to be the authenticity is missing. There's something missing. It's just going to be stimulating people, but it's where's this going? So we have to, you, it'll crash. So what we have to do is take it further. You have to fly. And the flying then is where we go into a deep reflective stage, that light shining through the prism where you're asking the who, what, when, where. There's that reflection on why, trying to get to the processing and the root. There's, you've got to capture that. And there's a way that you capture in a written form that I call a metacog that is not journaling, but it and pulls on our ability to connect the conscious with the non-conscious and activate creativity to another level totally and really opens up the networks of the brain and mind. And then you, um, that once you've done that step, the next step of flying, there's three steps to fly, is to then do reconceptualization or rechecking, which is this, this has happened, what do I do? It's the plans you make, the patterns and so on. And then you need to translate that into action, which just becomes lots of words and lots of ideas. Now, what are your actions? So you're your landing the plane would be then be the first step, which would be the act of reach. So that concept can be applied on in creating content, physically creating content. You can go through that process as a sort of brain building exercise, but you can also use that same process to work on your mental state, which could be blocking because could, you could be in toxic stress, which is giving you brain fog and memory issues and your creativity is just not there. So you could use it to find out why am I in this state? Then you could do some reading of, you know, the story, some, the, the fiction that I spoke about. So you could do a new metacog. I mean, you could do a neurocycle in 15 minutes. You could read for an hour and then you could do another neurocycle to create content. So it's a brain, the same five steps, but you use it for brain building. So you use it slightly differently and where you create generating content and that combination of three will put you on another level. It's what I do pretty much with all my work. So I want to welcome everybody to the PhD level of the Think Media podcast. And uh, this is very powerful. And for those that are sticking with us, I think the first thing I just want to ask briefly is, is there one main book or multiple books where you break this down? Because I know our listeners that are seeing how powerful this is, but also seeing, okay, self-awareness, is uh what which book is it so i would yeah this i would recommend this book to start with cleaning up a mental mess this is a great first start because the first part's a bit sciencey but it's easy reading the second part is the detail of how to do the neurocycle and in different applications like the uh, sound of brain building i also have this in an app so we have a mental health technology platform and so the ment- the app is called neurocycle which is easy because the neurocycle is that system and in that i then walk you through these decompression activities there's brain preparation activities and then i walk you through the 63 days how to do the five steps over 63 three days and then you can adapt that once you understand the basic process you can then adapt that we also are building by january we'll have a webinar feature inside the app where people can then ask questions and it becomes an interactive community so that would be this would be a great place to start and the app i would start with those two because it's actually then me literally walking you through the process step by step and helping you to apply it in in your context incredible so many more questions to come and uh more insights but definitely check out in the show notes um, cleaning up your mental mess. And that's going to walk you through doing this and then check out neurocycle. And, um, you actually, uh, you sent us a code to neurocycle 20, where people can grab 20% off any subscription. So rather than necessarily even understanding everything you broke down, knowing you have the science, you have the experience, you've got the results following the app step by step. And you just blew my mind because obviously I am much more on the surface level of entrepreneurship and business buzzwords. And so, oh, self-awareness is a superpower. And you're like, no, actually, mind management, self-regulation, neurocycles, 
being in a process of being able to have deep reflection, reconceptualization, and then taking action, actually building your brain, which was layers of distinction and mastery there. And of course, on the other side, I love what you said is this isn't easy. So if somebody was listening to this episode looking for some quick fix or quick hack, um, there's maybe band-aids here or there, breathing exercise or something like that, but you're really looking to transform the people you impact, myself, our community, everybody you serve, that they could go to a whole nother dimension, as you said, by going through these neurocycles, by putting in the work for 63 days and actually seeing uh, level upon level upon level of us tapping into the next version of us creativity wise, tapping into the next version of us as entrepreneurs, as parents, as people. And so this is all so powerful. I do, we promised earlier that we would circle back on some practical things we could do to address this big thing that you mentioned, which was stress or toxic stress. And anything else that maybe is blocking our brain health and our brain fog fog, uh, and causing brain fog, I'm convinced, um, or I know that our community is struggling with this, if not daily, consistently, wanting to do something. Oh man, I want to take action on the advice Sean gives. I want to, I've got some ideas, but there's that block there. And so what if, what are some tips for maintaining good brain health um, or specifically the stress, because that's really what you mentioned earlier. And you've already s shared many. So is there any other direction you want to take it besides going through a neurocycle or some of these other things? Well, I think the principle, Sean, thanks for asking that question. It's a really important question. Um, and it's one that we don't, you know, we're all aware of stress and things like that, but we don't really fully understand that it be, stress is actually good for us and we can embrace it and recognize when it's when it's tipping. So stress is it's kind of like a balancing act. You know, it's good for us if we're managing it, but if we don't, it becomes, you know, tips and it can pull us down. And so um, essentially the, the the probably the most important thing is to realize that you can't change what's happened to you, but you can change what it looks like inside of you. So the power to know that you can you can drive what the networks look like in your brain. You can actually change them. And you can change what it looks like inside of your body and, and your mind. And that then changes how you, how you function. That, that knowledge is very empowering and it gives people hope. And, and that's really, I think, key to, to, to starting this and enabling people to move forward. Then the other thing is also to realize that these are skills that we build, that we naturally are resilient as humans. We naturally are brilliant, but these are skills that we need to build over time. So mind management is something that we have to practice. Um, and in a mind, if, if you think of mind and if you think of what is the difference between mind and brain, that could help us understand stress better because your brain is not the thing that's doing the stress. It's your mind that's doing the stress. So messy mind, messy brain, messy body, messy life. So if you are consistently telling yourself, I have to work 15 hours a day, which every day is going to wipe you out because your brain is like your cell phone. It gets tired. And so you may think at hour 14, hey, I've done 15 hours. I'm really great. And then you wonder why you feel depressed the next day because you've worn your brain out and you've worn your conscious mind out. Your non-conscious mind doesn't get tired, but it, it, it constantly sends signals to your conscious and your, and your brain to, your brain to um, relax. So your brain is physical. It's a physical organ. If you're dead, your brain is disintegrating. But the fact that you're alive and able to listen to this podcast and watch this and um, watch this podcast you are making 800,000 to a million cells every second because you're alive because of your mind your mind is driving your physiology your mind is driving your capacity to build between 800,000 and a million cells every second I mean just let that sink in if you did you're not building those cells so that but the those cells then make up every organ of your body and every system of your body and that physical part is what your mind is using for you to function in life. So if the quality of my mind management is poor, the quality of the cells that I make are poor. Therefore, the quality of my body and over time, the way I'm physically and mentally going to show up is going to be impacted. So messy mind, messy brain, messy body, messy life. So that understanding is pretty key. In the first part of the app and, and that book, I do talk about this in a lot in my podcast that people can hear this all the time with my stuff, but it's really key. Then the other thing is that there's so much hope because you can, we've got this wisdom in us. So if we talk about messy mind, it's okay to be a mess. 
It's okay to be a mess. Embrace your messiness because life and humanity is messy. You're not going to know. You're not going to always do the right thing and say the right thing. And it's all experimental. And that is very, very normal. What is also normal is to manage the messiness. So it's, oh gosh, I got irritated. Okay. I got irritated. It's okay. I'm not going to beat myself up. I'm going to accept that I got irritated and I'm going to work out why and what am I going to do about it. That's very different to, oh, I got irritated again. I hate myself. I keep getting irritated. And then you're going to regret. If only I didn't do that. Now I've messed up another relationship. Well, now I've messed up another. And so you go down and, oh, now I've wasted three hours worrying. Oh, now I've lost more creativity. And, you know, that cycle just burns. And I've got to generate this income. And, you know, it becomes this very toxic cycle. Whereas if you can recognize, okay, I was messy. I made a total mess. I messed up for three hours in everything I did today or whatever. That's okay. What am I going to do about it? And you go through a neurocycle saying, okay, I was messy, um, this and this. And that ability of you to stand back and observe yourself and give yourself permission to be messy and say, okay, now let's manage this messiness. That is a key in, in um, managing toxic stress because you then work through the neurocycle and you get to the point of acceptance and you realize it's not who I am, it's what I'm going through. And it's okay, I can get through this. Even if I did upset other people, what am I going to do? I'm going to find a way to apologize. I mean, it's okay, we all mess up. We, we That'll stop us being so hard on ourselves. This ability that we have to have these conversations with ourselves is our wise mind. So as neuroscientists, what we see is that our psychoneurobiology, our mind brain body connection is wired for love. And I love telling people this. It's literally, and you've heard my work, you've heard me say this before. We don't have a single protein, right, or structure protein right down to the subatomic level in our mind brain body connection that is wired for anything but survival. Everything's on our side. We have this enormously infinite non-conscious, not unconscious. Unconscious is when you're asleep, not subconscious. Subconscious is a portal, not conscious. That's when you're awake. We have a non-conscious. That's your driving force. It is where your intelligence, your wisdom, your wired full of nature, every experience is stored. And it's your pretty much the core of your aliveness. It then works with the subconscious, which is just a doorway and the conscious, which is awake when you're awake. But your conscious and subconscious so your conscious mind is very slow in comparison to your non-conscious. So you've got this enormous non-conscious that has every experience that you've ever had built into these thought trees. And your non-conscious working with your, within your mind, brain, body, with your brain reacting to your mind, because your brain is just the physical, the mind making all of this stuff work on a psychological and neurophysiological level. But this combination, this wide for love combination of our psychoneurobiology driven by the non-conscious is on your side. And it's searching and seeing, okay, that cluster of thought trees over there is this dark, dark cluster of trees. And that is messing with your creativity and your productivity. So that needs to be addressed. And it may have absolutely nothing to do with your current work, but it's got something to do with something that happened in childhood or something that happened recently in your relationship or with a best friend or something. And it's become dominant and it keeps Coming back every time you're trying to do something, the thoughts, they said this, they said that, they're doing this, they're doing that. They, and at night you find yourself, you're driving your car and you find yourself, those intrusive thoughts, you need to make them your best friend. You need to know what to do to, you need to step into that non-conscious mind and recognize your non-conscious mind is sending those thoughts up through the subconscious into your conscious mind. And the reason you keep thinking about them is because your non-conscious is telling you to think about them in order to process them so they don't control you and you control them. But what do we do? We say, oh, I mustn't think about that. And we shove it down. What do you do five minutes later? You think about it again. But it's worse than it was before. So if you don't manage something and you keep thinking about it, it gets bigger and bigger and more disruptive to your functioning. So what we want to do is really listen to the depths of those messages that are moving from the non-conscious through the subconscious into our conscious mind through those signals attached to those intrusive thoughts and take the time to step into a wide full of nature and stand back and observe why am I in this mess at the moment? It's okay to be there, but why am I in this mess? What can I do? Okay, that's related to that. I need to allocate 15 minutes every morning for the next 63 days to resolve this issue. So, And then, then you compartmentalize and say, okay, now I'm going to do that. So for the rest of today, I'm now going to work on whatever I have to work on. And that kind of thinking is critical to, to taking you to another level creatively wise.
This is also fascinating. I've got some spontaneous questions for you that um, I'm actually deeply passionate about. From your expertise, there's a big trend right now called neurotropics or nootropics, brain drugs. Um, a lot of times vitamins or different concoctions. Um, I'm imagining it's probably a pretty lucrative industry and it's growing and lots of people are launching uh, energy drinks or drinks or in pill form and maybe even deeper than that there's whole the whole biohacking movement what's your take do any of these work do you encourage people to be leery of them and are there natural things that we can do to support better brain health so thank you that's a great question so first of all um, as humans we're always looking for a quick fix so it sounds so wonderful to be able to put a device on your head to take a nootropic to take a supplement and think, okay, that's going to solve my sleep issues. That's going to solve my, but they're not going to solve it. They're going to be part of the toolbox. So I think all of them do have a place. I mean, as science is advancing, you know, the science of nootropics, it's still pretty new, but it's, you know, and unfortunately supplement industry is not regulated, which is unfortunate, but at least there is some good science that's happening out there. So I wouldn't, um, I would say that they are all part of the toolbox, but if you look at them as being a solution, like if I go and lie on this bed and do that amount of that stimulation, you know, these sound bars and there's these, labs you can go to and you can I mean there's so many devices you don't even have to go anywhere you can put them on your wrist on your watch these things that you can put all over you and onto you and um, they can help you with you know there's one that you can put on your chest and your chest is like a cathedral and it sends sound waves through your chest and it can that sensation can calm you down I mean if you're feeling really worked up do that but don't think it's the solution. It's part of the entire solution. In fact, the percentage that those biohacks play, if you had to, if I had to give you an estimate, it's around about 10% of supporting how you function. So I would put biohacks, diet, exercise, and people are going to think I'm crazy, but I'm going to justify this now, but do them, but they form about 10% and a very valuable 10% of your functioning. The other 90% is mind. The most important hack is your mind because your mind is your aliveness and your aliveness, what we know from how the mind drives your neurophysiology, like I said, you're making 800 to million cells every second. The quality of those cells depends on your mind, not on the biohack not on the nootropic. Those are just giving you raw materials that hopefully you're going to be able to utilize. But if your mind's not working, you won't use the nootropics anyway. You can take as many as you want, but they're not, they'll give you a burst of energy and a little bit of benefit, but it's going to be band aid once again. So we know from the research for your body cells to actually assimilate that nootropic, for your brain to take advantage, your mind brain body connection to take advantage of that vibration that's moving through your, your cathedral like thorax um, and your you know behind your ribs that the, the the cavity that it makes you have to have your mind under control so you've got to work on the 90 percent, and that's where i believe there's a massive gap sean and which is what i'm trying to address with my work is let's work on the 90 because we're spending 100 percent of our time on that on the 10 percent and zero time on the 90 percent or maybe maybe it's nine percent on the or that and one percent on the mind and we've got to get the mind dominant and then we can add all those in as needed. You don't need all of them. You need to work out what works for you, what is affordable and what's workable. You just blew my mind because as a as a type A driven entrepreneur that, you know, eventually sees a Dave Asprey um and a Tim Ferris and bulletproof coffee. Um it's really it's really easy to get into all of this biohacking, but literally to say that that's 10%, including diet and exercise, and that 90% is the mind, it really shines a light. And I think that is a huge unlock moment for all of us to think about, man, we got to take this seriously and waiting for us on the other side of improving our mind management and our self-regulation and building up our brain man, is untold um, dimensions, as you're saying, of, of new energy, new creativity. I'm curious because you get to work with so many high-level people and, and type A-driven people like me. I think about the entrepreneur wiring, the content creator wiring. What makes that kind of entrepreneur wiring specifically sub susceptible to burnout? What is it about driven people and probably many ambitious people that listen to this podcast, all different personalities, but they want to build something, create something, get out there, start a side hustle, but maybe not just burnout. What are some of the other cautions that that personality type should be thoughtful of in, 
I heard it said this way. There's a book called The Entrepreneur Roller Coaster. I don't know if it's just entrepreneurs, but sometimes we could be susceptible to radical swings and really high highs and really low lows and building our brain, mind management could help us. But why is that, that maybe we're particularly susceptible to burnout? Excellent question. And if I may, I think that the susceptibility to burnout applies to literally anyone. So you could take a, a mom who's trying to juggle four kids or something, or people that are you know parenting and working, or people that are in a job, not on necessarily an entrepreneur, and just being alive, dealing with what's going on around us. So people are very... Um, burnt out. I think it's the, the problem has increased with technology. Technology is fantastic. I have no problem with social media. I'm not one of those people that says social media causes problems. What I say, it's not the social media, it's your management of the social media. Once again, it's not the physical, it's the mind. It's the 90% behind. That's what we've got to pay attention to. So burnout comes from us, number one, not paying attention to the mind and pushing, not learning to listen to when we have those very strong messages from our wise mind telling us to slow down, telling us to speed up in different ways, telling us to focus on different things in different ways. So I'm obsessed with psychoneurobiology and neuroscience. I have a full research team. I can go for 15 hours without even realizing, but I've learned to listen to my body. I've learned to manage that. Otherwise, I will burn out. And there are times that I have recognized, I've trained myself to recognize the signs of burnout. And so susceptibility to burnout, yes, some people are definitely, we can definitely agree, some people are will push themselves more than others. Others will, their kind of burnout is more, I, I, they'll pull back and they'll do nothing kind of, so will do much less. But there's others that will just burn those, those bridges and burn those hours. Remember, think of it like this. Your non-conscious mind knows what you can handle. And it knows exactly, because it's a wide full of nature, it knows what you need to survive. And what you need to survive is periods of rest. So your brain does, your brain is honestly like a cell phone. It does work, it, it goes flat. And if you're still trying to push your mind ideas, your mind part, the bioenergy of your mind through a physical brain that's now kind of winding down, you know your cell phone doesn't work very well once you put all those apps open and you know once it crashes you can't do anything with your brain your, your cell phone and that's the same sort of thing so it's once again it's learning to listen to those signals and those signals might be right at this moment you need to take a thinker moment and i teach a lot about thinker moments and a thinker moment is around about every 45 minutes to an hour, taking two to three minutes to just let your mind wander. And that activates the default mode network, which I know was one of the questions you were interested in, in asking me about. The default mode network enables, uh, when it's activated in a thinker moment, it, your mind is basically telling your brain to restore and replenish. And it allows a lot of firing of energy around the different parts of the brain to restore and replenish. And in doing that, lots of thoughts will start popping up. And you don't have to do anything with them in that thinker moment. You just have to let your mind wander. And then you, when you stop, you kind of time it around about you know 30 seconds to a minute every 45 minutes and then try and take 10 to 15 minutes every um, at least once during the day. And then at the end of the time period, make a few notes of the thoughts that have come up. Now, you may not have time to go work on them at that moment because you've got work to do or things that you're meeting in that you're in or something. But make a de decision to put that into your neurocycle work. I recommend people spend, allocate 15 to 45 minutes a day deliberately working on using the neurocycle to manage whatever's going on in your life. And uh, so if things pop in those mind-wandering moments, things will come up that are potentially depleting your energy. And that's what happens. They get pushed through the default mode network time. When you when you do a thinker moment, you activate the non-conscious mind to activate the default mode network to send through messages to you via thoughts of what you need to work on. And so that's why I say write them down. And when you find the time, go work on those because those are the things that are draining your energy and pushing you to burn out. And those are the things that will tell you things like, okay, you're worrying too much about this person. You way too, uh, you're trying to fix that person. You actually can't, you need boundaries. And if you carry on trying to fix them and getting totally frustrated because they're not changing, that's going to burn you out. On top of that, you're trying to then be X to X person and you're trying to, but you're taking all that energy from trying to fix that person it's not going away, it's hovering all the time, like a hovering anxiety, and you're taking that into the workplace. And it's that constant on that is draining you, and you're going to sleep at night still worrying about that. So that's a big thing, so you need to work on that. And so taking thinker moments 
helps to replenish and make us aware of those. And then you then actively and deliberately put those into your neurocycle times. You've got a plan that prevents burnout. So there are days, like I had, we had team meetings all week this week. One of the days there was 15 hours. I was so stimulated creativity that I went to sleep at 8.30, woke up at 1.30, did six hours of creative work, then went into an eight-hour meeting. Okay, The next day I only did three hours of work. And I made sure that I did a lot of reading and a lot of, you know, re- you know walks and relaxing and just putting stuff back, not generating out and um, resting. And, but I know how to do that. And that's how I prevented burnout. But if I did another 15 hour day, which I could easily have done because I was so stimulated. And also if I wasn't working on something that was worrying me, which I am working on something that's worrying me, I would have put those two together. I would have burnt out. So that's my advice to people. Find out through the thinker moments, what is the draining stuff? And make a plan to do neurocycles to then get an action to deal with that. And then at the same time, learn to, um, to, to in the thinker moments, you really are replenishing. If, you, if you're having 15 hour days or long days or whatever, you need to make sure that you then counterbalance that with less hours if possible the next day. And if you do that, you'll find that actually you'll achieve in those four hours what you would have done in 15 anyway. Um, because you know, you, you just speed up your work because you've given yourself time to rest. Does that make sense? It does. And if I was to take a thinker moment um, for three minutes every hour, you're suggesting? Well, anything from 30 seconds to three minutes every hour. And probably not, a thinker moment is not scrolling on Instagram. No. It's closing your eyes and it's just looking at your keyboard. If you're at a computer, it's literally closing your eyes and looking at your keyboard or it's just looking out the window and staring blind. But closing your eyes. You can close your eyes if you want. I would recommend it, but you don't have to because you might be in an office with a bunch of people and they might think you're nuts. So <laughs> it's, it's what you feel. So sometimes I close my eyes. Sometimes I just will stay off into the distance with a vacant look in my eyes. And that's when I do it. And I've trained myself. At first, you're going to forget to do them. And I make sure that I do at least a 10 minute one somewhere during the middle of the day. And it's, it's just something you've got to train in. It, they are absolute burnout preventers. And this is one of those habits that um, also causes you to course correct. Is that accurate? Maybe because midday to your point, wow, I've been burning so much energy up with this whole other part of my mind, of my brain, of my emotions, worrying about a situation I can't fix. Wow, I've really got into this social media loop, but that's not my most high value task right now. But I find myself sometimes getting into a loop checking the doom scroll or rather it's like I, or i just or the loop from i wonder if anybody replied on twitter let me check out the youtube yeah. comments has anybody replied over on facebook yet what are the youtube is anyone engaging on instagram stories i finish i check my email and i do it again kind of just for the dopamine loop and sometimes it's hard for me to break out of that like to kind of reset and i just keep going back for it and i even kind of know i'm doing it but i sort of stay in it and it's partly related to procrastination you're saying a thinker moment is uh, our non-conscious is able to communicate with us and say, hey, get back on track. You're wasting your energy. Is that accurate? Absolutely. So your non-conscious, think of your non-conscious like a giant infinite forest and every tree is every experience you've ever had built into a thought network with memories from whatever age in the womb we start building memories to the age that you act now. And there's bunches of green ones and dark looking ones that would be the toxic experiences and they're different sizes and the newer memories memories in the in the trees are the small trees so the newer thoughts are the so in other words just think of that and then through the middle you've got this dark forest that's beautiful beyond your the most exquisite thing that you've ever seen think of that as your wise mind and that's where you reside that's the you-ness and you your you-ness your wisdom resides there and it scans and it sees okay that is lots of pulsing energy at that particular cluster of trees and it's creating a viral spread through a bunch of other trees shoops the non-conscious finds that sends that through the subconscious which is a portal into your conscious mind as wandering thoughts as intrusive thoughts they are your new best friend so in a think in the neurocycle you're going to find them when you actively neurocycle daily and when to find them in during the course of the uh, course of a day to help yourself and to activate the default mode network take those thinker moments and then that helps to pick up on those things and it'll help the procrastination as well because procrastination just basically is where we feel so caught up and get burnt, very often burn out and procrastination go together 
um, because you kind of you lose a little bit of hope. You don't. Some things are blocking you, and it just I don't know what to do. So it's and then you get scared to do it. So procrastination. So you've got to tap into your unconscious wisdom. That's going to be your answers for your for what you want to do are there, and we've got it. It's there. We we are wise, and you can test your wiseness. People come to you all the time. Everyone comes to each other. You you for advice. Someone will come to you and say, "Hey, Sean, I've got this," and they tell you something, and you give them the most amazing advice, and you think, "Gee, I wish I would apply that myself." I mean, we really have got wisdom in us. Kids are fantastic with wisdom. Draw on your children's wisdom. Tell them scenarios. They will tell you the most simple things that are the most incredible wisdom. You know, that's also I wrote this book, help, "How to Help Your Child Clean Up Their Mental Mess," which is how to help parents help children, parents, teachers, etc. Do the neuro cycle from as young as two and three, so they can then develop these skills as early as possible. Well, I'm I'm excited to read that one as well. I have a three year old now and a one year old, so so that is the season that we're in. Okay, I want to honor your time. We even have a brainy character. Just so these cartoons throughout this book teaching the neuro cycles. So I've created a brainy character, and brainy walks your mental health journey with you. And brainy has a superpower called the neuro cycle. So the character, and we have a coloring book as well, is then um, the character in. And even the adults love it, inner child work, whatever. But for kids, this is an amazing tool because Brainy is throughout the book. So you always, you know, Brainy's helping you live life. Oh, man, I so love it so much. And I do want to honor your time, but do you have a few more minutes as we land the plane? I've got about two minutes and I've got another interview in ten, in about five minutes after that. So I'll have just need a couple of minutes to swap over. <laughs> okay, perfect. So let's, let's uh, land the plane. I do want to mention everything. All the uh, books and resources will be in the show notes. You can also check out, of course, how to help your child clean up their mental mess and how to clean up your mental mess, that core book to learn this neurocycle. Check out the app and there is a 20% off promo code that you can grab in the description. Last question. What do you see? How can business businesses stay ahead of the curve. If a business owner, uh, businesses stay ahead of the curve, leveraging upcoming insights uh, for the world of cognitive neuroscience. I'm a founder CEO. I want to help my team implement this. Any parting words so that uh, we could have a better next one, five, and 10 years by tapping into cognitive neuroscience? Well, cognitive neuroscience is based on the reductionistic principle of the brain produces the mind and it doesn't because the brain produces, the brain responds to the mind. So first thing that I would advise is to shift your perspective and realize that the future of your business as a business leader and any business leader, anyone in business, anyone, is to tap into the wisdom of your non-conscious. So cognitive neuroscience is actually going to limit you. It's not going to grow you, even though that's the word that's used because cognition, brain doesn't produce thoughts. The brain responds to the mind and mind builds the thoughts into the brain. So it's just it's a slight shift, but it's a paradigm shift that will shift how you look at yourself. So you're not controlled by your brain. And it's not that your brain is producing patterns that make you function in a certain way. We, if the mind changes the brain, and if we change the brain in the wrong way, then we create driving patterns that will influence us in the wrong way. So our power comes on uh, in understanding that. So in terms of getting ahead of the game, we need to build our brain. So we need to um, be with our mind, with our wise mind, decide what areas related to our business do we need to know more about? So what studying do you need to do? It doesn't mean to have to go back to school. You can if you want to, but there's knowledge out there. There's books out there. There's entrepreneurs out there. There's courses out there. What is related is linked to your field that you need to get new knowledge and that new knowledge as you expand your knowledge base and build your brain. So your intelligence and creativity will rise. And you may not directly use that input, but the process of looking in your field and expanding in your field and tapping into a bit of philosophy too, the philosophy, which is science, science is knowledge. It's all knowledge. Um, it helps you think a bit more broadly. And that way you build a knowledge base that increases your resilience and in enables you to then draw, draw on, you know, you may never know, you may read 10 books and then there's one phrase in one of those books, but the exercise of building your brain has changed your networks and increased your intelligence and creativity. And that's what you want to grow your business in another direction. Dr. Caroline Leaf, thank you so much for coming on the Think Media Podcast. Check out her social medias and all of her resources in the show notes, and we will see you in the next episode of the Think Media Podcast.